talk about <coughs> some of my favorite country. Now, I was introduced to the geology of Western U.S. beginning in the 1960s. Uh, here is Ariel Roth uh, going through a very cold stream uh, in Yellowstone Park. And beginning with his, uh, the work I, I uh, did with him, uh, the, the teaching that he did, I uh, got interested in the Southwest and many fascinating things. And I've spent several decades uh, wandering through the West here, studying the geology and just enjoying the scenes. <clears throat> Arizona and Utah, there's so many uh, geological wonders that are just fascinating. This coxcomb monocline, um, the water pocket fold, I mean, I could go all morning just showing you beautiful pictures. These mysterious potholes in the Navajo sandstone and, of course, the Grand Canyon. Um, today I'm going to talk about something that has fascinated me for a long time. <coughs> uh, first saw this again on one of Ariel Roth's trips, 1960s. This grand staircase. Going from Arizona up into Utah, you have this series of cliffs. Uh, pink cliffs, gray cliffs, white cliffs, vermilion cliffs, chocolate cliffs, and then the Grand Canyon. And these cut through the geologic column. The Paleozoic rocks are right here, the Mesozoic rocks, and, and the, some Cenozoic. And these, uh, these formations uh, come along here and then end in a cliff, one set of formations at a, at a time. So how does that work? Well, in, re in doing research on subjects like this, <coughs> we're very much influenced by our worldview. This is the typical approach that a scientist will take. You start with your worldview of naturalism, millions of years. You build models and hypotheses based on that, uh, on the assumptions involved in that worldview. Well, I'm going to use a different approach. <coughs> take a Bible-based worldview with the creation of the flood and build my models and hypotheses on these. I, the, the Bible gives me some directions. It says, look here and you'll find something. And then I use the scientific method to, to pursue those hypotheses and try to understand them. In this presentation, I will introduce the grand staircase, consider how a staircase could form, and then present a hypothesis, the relation to the grand staircase to catastrophic uh, geologic processes. Oops. Um, the grand staircase, first of all, is it real? Is this something that, uh, you know, really you can see if you go there? Well, <coughs> yes, it is real. Um, let's start with this, this lowest cliff, the chocolate cliffs, uh, Moenkopi Formation, the Shinarump on top of it, where it's well exposed. It's, a, it's an impressive cliff going along uh, from e east to west. Then, if we go uh, above that, and so um, the chocolate cliff is just off the, the scene here to the left. And the next cliff is the Vermilion Cliff, Triassic rocks. And then the white cliffs, uh, especially the Navajo sandstone above that. Now you notice what we have here. There's a, there's a wide plateau. These rock formations, of course, uh, for those of you who are not geologists, they're not just something you see on the surface. They go back into the hillside for miles, maybe hundreds of miles. And this is just where you're seeing them at the surface. And so you have a wide plateau of these same rocks, and then they end in a cliff. Above that, there's another wide plateau ending in a cliff, just like it, it's pictured here. And so the Vermilion Cliffs are this next one. The White Cliffs are the one right above that. And the same picture again for, for context. And now we look closely at the white cliffs. They, they go across southern Utah and, and finally reach the Zion Park over here uh, to the west. And above that, we have gray cliffs. Gray cliffs are, are this one up here. Another view of it, here we have the, at least a small exposure of the chocolate cliffs. And then the Vermilion Cliffs Triassic, White Cliffs Triassic. And then the gray cliffs are right in here. They're a little more obscure. And the pink cliffs, uh, Eocene, are at the very top, way up here. So here we have this sequence, one above the other. <clears throat> and if you get to the right viewpoint, you can see them clearly. The, the pink cliffs are, are 
that's what you see in, at Bryce uh, Canyon uh, National Park. That's the Claren Formation, Eocene, <coughs> used to be called Wasatch. Again, this series of cliffs, and they are very real. Um, as I mentioned, the, pink, the gray cliffs are not so distinctive. They're, uh, they're very real, uh, right in here between the gray cliffs and the pink cliffs. They're, they're Cretaceous rocks, so they're kind of a, a, you know obscure gray color. And they're soft rocks, so they don't make such a distinct cliff. But it's a very real element in this, uh, in this series of cliffs. Let's look at them from above, uh, satellite view. <coughs> This is the border between uh, Arizona and Utah. Um, and so here we have the, the chocolate cliffs. They come right along here. Then they drop down and then up over in here. Uh, the Vermilion Cliffs, that's the next one here. It, it's right along here, very prominent. If, if you're driving along them, they're, uh, they're an ever-present cliff. And then the White Cliffs, uh, the, the Navajo, you can, you can see them quite clearly here, the White uh, line wanders across. The gray cliffs are in between. And then the pink cliffs, you can see them pretty clearly right here. So that is the Grand Staircase. It, it is very real. <coughs> and it is a fascinating um, feature to try to explain. And the question we have is, how does a staircase form? So here we have the vermilion, the white cliff, the gray cliffs, and the pink cliffs. How, do that, how does that form? How do you make something like that? Um, let's see what happened there. OK. What I did <coughs> for this project, I uh, began with the, the, the geologic maps of Utah and Arizona, photographed them, and I entered them into uh, Adobe Illustrator. Then I uh, overlay that with the, an outline of the, what's called the Colorado Plateau. Uh, it's an it's a area that is geologically very uh, uh, continuous. You can follow it easily. It's, it's a fascinating area to study. It actually goes over into Colorado and New Mexico, but I'm dealing here only with uh, Arizona and Utah. <clears throat> so, and if you go over here, it's a, it's a whole different geologic phenomenon, and you get over into the Rocky Mountains, it's different. But this is a, a, a unit that we can understand uh, more easily. <coughs> so uh, when we look at, at these cliffs and uh, the way they're formed, it's, there's one thing that you, you won't immediately see. And that is geologists consider that these layers that form here once covered this whole region. And they've been eroded away. And so the pink cliffs, gray cliffs, white cliffs, that all those rock layers used to go all the way across over into here. And they're, they're gone. They have eroded away. And here's a, a, an interesting clue that they, these formations really did used to extend over here. This, this hill is, is right in here somewhere. It's a, 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 a remnant of the Moenkopi, which is this one, uh, showing that it really used to come down here. And there are other remnants as well. Well, well, we need to ask a question. Did they really extend down here? Or did they actually just um, pinch out? Were they only deposited where we see them? And they pinch out. Something is not working right here with my pointer. Um, so were they like this? Well, um, we ha I have a big uh, geologic atlas down in the, the lab that has a uh, maps of all these formations and, and where they occur and how thick they are. And uh, they, don't, they don't pinch out. They don't thin as you go this way. A few of them might thin a little. Others get thicker as you go south. Uh, they don't pinch out. And so it, is, it looks like this is really the way it was. They used to come um, all the way out here. And they've been eroded away. So <coughs> um, these steps cover the area. Then you have what is called scarp retreat. Scarp is another fancy word for a cliff. How do these cliffs retreat? How do they get eroded back? Uh, here's a, with the help of Photoshop, I've, I've got a, three scenes here to help us to understand what we're talking about. 
So imagine a time when those who are right above the other are very obvious. And then they begin to erode back to the north until they get farther in the distance and now to where they are now. They've eroded back. That's what we're talking about so when we say scarp retreat. These have eroded back, retreated back to the north, to their current situation. So they used to be out here. Now they have moved back. Uh, next question is, what really is included in the Grand Staircase? What geographic area is, is covered? This is, if you read descriptions of the Grand Staircase, this is generally what they give you. Uh, this is, you might call, the traditional Grand Staircase. It starts up here uh, with Bryce Canyon, somewhere in that, <coughs> excuse me, in that area, and it goes down to the Grand Canyon. Or other publications will, will end it right along in here, south of these cliffs. Um, and here we have a, a, a cross section. Imagine I took a slice right down through here and turned it up so you can see the cross section. So you, the green is the Paleozoic that goes all the way down to the Grand Canyon. And then these successive um, rock layers, one above the other, with the pink cliff at the very top. And I'll use these uh, all the way along to, to illustrate what we're talking about. All right, this is the Grand Staircase. But, um, to cut it off the Grand Canyon is very arbitrary because those, those Paleozoic layers continue to the south. The Grand Canyon is just a gash across the landscape. It's not really a meaningful, way, place, a meaningful place to stop uh, the Grand Staircase. Those Paleozoic layers, as you see here, they continue and get thicker going to the south all the way down until they end in the cliff called the Mugion Rim in central Arizona. So this is all really part of the Grand Staircase, and it goes on over here into New Mexico. This is a uh, one shot of the, the, the Mugion Rim, the cliff. This is the last step in the Grand Staircase. Oh, the last step. Is, and when you go to the top of this, it isn't just a, a mountain that goes down on the other side. This is a, another one of those plateaus that goes forever all the way up uh, into Utah. And there's more to it than that, I will argue. <clears throat> so here it goes down to the Mugion Rim. But you go to the north, and you look at this cross section. These layers continue. There's, there's a, uh, an uplift in here that's been eroded away. But those layers continue up to the north. And on top of this, this part of the Grand Staircase, you have the Green River Formation and the Uinta Formation. So really, this is a staircase starting in northern Utah going all the way down through the Colorado Plateau, all the way down to central Arizona. Um, but I know it looks kind of complicated in here, so am I really giving the, the, the clear picture? Well, these complications, these green areas, are, are just areas where you have a, an uplift, a bubble in the landscape. That's been, the top has been eroded off to expose uh, these same, pre -came, these same uh, Paleozoic sediments. Kaibab limestone just continues way up here. Um, if, if there's some way we could iron out those wrinkles, it would be clearer. Well, with Adobe Illustrator, we can do that. So we flatten it out, <coughs> take out those wrinkles, and then you can see clearly this, this staircase continuing all the way up into northern uh, Utah, with this, all of this being what, what's called a red rock country. Red rocks everywhere, just amazing amount of, of red rock. <coughs> And uh, it's, this is the, the northern extent. And it, it goes a little bit down this way along, uh, along the west side. And in fact, um, if, if, we take, if we go down here, we put those wrinkles back in so we can see what's going on. <clears throat> and you go up here, you look across from the, the center of fell swell across through here. Now we have those same layers. This is the grand staircase can be seen here uh, on the northwest corner. With the chocolate cliffs in, in the shadows here, the vermilion cliffs, white cliffs, the same rock formations forming these, pink cliffs, and now with the Green River formation on top. So it's a very pervasive phenomenon, this, this staircase. <coughs> so let's ask, how do we explain how this formed? Is this river, uh, the, the sort of conventional geologic approach would be that the rivers carved, cut this, fluvial processes, which is river erosion. Is that work? Well, I put in here on these dark uh, dotted lines the, the, the main um, drainages, the river, ch river channels. 
And so let's look and see if these seem to follow a pattern that would explain these cliffs. Well, here's one that could explain this, what is a, a canyon here. But more, more often, they just cut right across these, these big structural features. They cut right across uh, this one, right across here. It comes right across here and across here, uh, down through here. Across, they cut across this stairway pattern. They don't follow the pattern in a way that would explain how it formed. Um, we have some Cretaceous remnants. These gray are, are remnants of Cretaceous that are still there. Um, sitting on top of the red rocks. Here we have Black Mesa. Um, and uh, you know that's one of these remnants. And the, here are the rivers again go across this thing. They don't across this cliff. Uh, these rivers go north, these rivers go south. But uh, let's um, look at a, at a hypothesis here. I suggest this hypothesis. The landscape is best explained by a massive catastrophic water flow over the entire area. The, the rivers don't seem to have the explanation for it. It needs something far, far bigger. And I suggest that the modern drainage develops only at the end and after that major erosion process. They are not, they don't have the ability to cut um, the staircase. Um, and we have to look at some other features that someone may say, well, the, yeah, but Cal uh, Utah has some uh, some serious faults and folds. Maybe those explain it. So we have to take a look at those. Here's a cross section taken right through here. Um, cross section of the geology of southern Utah. And there are several major uh, faults. You can see in each case this, this green Paleozoic uh, drops down to the east. Uh, it's higher on the west of the fault, on the east side of the fault. Well, on the west side of this block. Okay, so they got three faults, and they go north and south, right up through, one of them's through here, another one up th <coughs> through here. So they don't follow the cliffs. Again, they cut across those cliffs. And go out here farther to the east, there are three major folds, uh, the Coxcomb monocline, the water pocket fold monocline and the comb ridge monocline. So maybe they could explain it. And here, here's another view of the two of these cliffs, major cliffs. Uh, this uh, clear information here is several thousand feet above where it is here. So those are significant th features, but they don't offer an explanation for the staircase. <coughs> Let's look at those folds. Uh, here happens to be the middle one, the water pocket fold. Uh, you're looking north. And this is, these rocks are all folded up to the west and then level off, more or less. So you can see that here. This, this rock comes out of the ground, folds up, and then folds over this way. So that's a, a monocline. It's folded in one direction. And that fold goes right up through here, north to south. Uh, another one, the coxcomb, uh, which is, uh, let's see, this is the, here's the, the coxcomb right here. Again, you're looking north. This goes north and south. It's folded up to the left. And the other one, the uh, Comb Ridge monocline, does the same thing. We're looking north, and it is, it's folded um, to the west. But these go north and south. They cut across the staircase pattern. They don't offer an explanation for the staircase. And if we look here in, in, in detail, this is the Coxcomb monocline, the rocks are folding up this way. And there's a river here, so did the river cut this? Well, not really. It, it just, this must have been eroded by some far larger process. And the river just cuts it right across that monocline and cuts, it comes down through this valley. This valley is formed by these layers, this layer coming up here, this layer coming up here, and the valley is between. Uh, and the river follows that, and it doesn't do anything except make slight modifications in the landscape. So it takes something bigger to form the landscape. The rivers don't do it. They only form the, the, the minor details uh, as we get to the end of it, <coughs> of that process. Well, let's look at, at one interesting feature here that, that is a further illustration. Uh, this is called Black Mesa. 
looking from the air. It's, it's over here in northeastern Arizona, Black Mesa. You can see why they call it Black Mesa. It looks black from the air. It's a, it's a pretty high cliff all along this side, and it's dipping towards the south. Um, okay, so how did that form? How did, it, um, how did the river patterns and everything form? How does that relate to the shaping of the mesa? Well, as I mentioned, these drainages go north. These drainages that start on the mesa go south. It drains to the south. And <clears throat> if we look a little bit closer, on top of this cliff, we have these valleys. And the valleys don't drain over the cliff. They didn't, they didn't erode the cliff. The, the, river, the drainages here start at the top of the cliff, and they go south. Uh, each one of these starts at the cliff and goes south. And each one of these little drainage valleys is its own dendritic drainage system. You have little streams coming in from the side, coming into this drainage, and that river goes to the south. So how did these valleys form? Um, it looks like maybe the mesa used to go farther north, and these drainages got started when it was up there, and it has, the cliff has eroded back and left these valleys which we could call hanging valleys, or they've been called beheaded valleys. Here we are, um, looking from down here in the valley. Notice the town Rough Rock. That's, this area is, is barren rocks. You have towns like Rough Rock, Round Rock, Rock Point. Um, okay, so here's Rough Rock. This canyon right here is, is this one, looking from below. And right over here is, is this couple of canyons. Okay, so they you think about how they form, they, the, the river starts, the drainage starts here and goes south. So how did that get formed? Well, again, it looks like the mesa used to go much farther north. These valleys got started, the drainage got started, and some, something eroded the cliff back. Not the river, because the river is going, is going that way, not over the cliff. Um, and that's the way it seems to be interpreted by, by others. <coughs> leaving these hanging valleys or beheaded valleys. And I'll have more to say about those in, in a few minutes. But let's uh, consider some hypotheses. And I like to use the concept of, of multiple working hypotheses. You, you start to study something. Okay, you don't take the first idea that comes to mind and think, oh, that's my hypothesis. Uh, I'll work with that. Because, you know, that... that you get attached to that, and you won't think of other possibilities. What other possibilities are there? So the best approach is to use what the geologist Chamberlain recommended, multiple working hypotheses. You try to think of all the hypotheses that come to mind, that you can think of. Um, not just your favorite ones. You need to include some you don't like. But all, all the possible explanations you can think of. Each one of those is a hypothesis. Then you have something you can begin to test. Test between these hypotheses and figure out which is more reasonable. And like I say, we need to include some we don't even like. Um, OK, so here are six possibilities. Um, number one, landscape formation, one catastrophe at the end of the global flood. Or two, maybe you have a series of these events. It's not just one event, uh, but they, they're all associated with the end of the flood. Um, number three, um, you have one cat catastrophe later, perhaps in association with glaciation. That's a possibility. Or a series of such events. And then five and six, we go to a different approach. This would be a conventional geological approach. Uh, erosion by rivers and rain over about five million years. And I, I use that figure of five million years because uh, within the, in a standard geologic time scale, all this erosion is, is believed to have been fairly recent, I mean, within 5 million years, out of the 540 million years in, in the uh, Phenerozoic. There's evidence that it, was, it, it didn't occur over uh, tens or hundreds of millions of years. It was fairly recent, uh, like they would say, uh, 5 million years. Okay, so that's why I use that figure here. Or number six, erosion by fluvial, which means river processes. Somewhat more extreme than this, but, but over millions of years. So <clears throat> we've got six hypotheses, and we can, we can narrow this down 
to two working hypotheses. Uh, number one through four, we can put into a working hypothesis, scarp retreat by catastrophic basin-wide water flow events. Uh, or the working hypothesis two comes from these, number, from number five and six, scarp retreat by processes observable or feasible today, not catastrophic, but something that we could picture today uh, working. So working hypothesis two, that is the conventional uh, geological explanation. All right, so we have these, these two. <clears throat> Uh, we've already looked at the rivers, and I I'm, I'm, uh, did my best to convince you that the rivers won't do it. They don't, the river pattern does not seem to fit what would carve these, these cliffs. So how do you, so what do we do with that? Um, now maybe you could say, well, maybe it isn't a river. Maybe it was a, a huge lake that, that covered this. Well, during this time, there were huge lakes in the west. Uh, enormous lakes. Lake Bonneville covered much of Utah. But these are, these are off to the west. The area we're studying is in here. Uh, and there were no big lakes here. And so lakes, there doesn't seem to be a possibility of lakes doing this. We're, we're kind of left with, with rivers. Um, <clears throat> now I, I found a paper that, that indeed, uh, and, and incidentally there's very little literature on this, on this Grand Staircase by geologists. They, they're just, um, there must be something I've missed, but I, all I could find was this one paper that doesn't try to explain how they, they, the cliffs were eroded, but it, it analyzes how long did it take? How, do, how did this process work? And say, okay, this paper concludes, um, th well, he, he's working with hypothesis two here, scarp retreat by processes observable or feasible today which in this case would be a river process, basically. And he uh, concluded these scarps eroded back, each scarp eroded back between one and nine kilometers per million years. That's the rate at which they moved back. Like I say, he doesn't try to analyze how they eroded, just try analyzes the time. And, <clears throat> you know, he doesn't talk about assumptions. Um, and, and I look at the paper and I wonder, okay, did he do careless work? No, I don't think so. It, work looks fine. But his work is based on two assumptions, which he doesn't state, but they're obvious in the paper. One is this all happened by modern processes that we can observe today. And number two, using the radiometric time scale. Okay, he's based it on these and his conclusions are dependent on those hypotheses, on those uh, assumptions. They are dependent on them. They, his, his analysis only works if we take these two assumptions. But I, I see problems, as we've been discussing, with, with his explanation. One problem is rivers don't cut, they don't carve staircases. A river erodes through the land and it leaves a cliff or a hill side on either side, on both sides. Rivers don't cut staircases that go down from one level to the next. Uh, they, they just don't do that. <clears throat> um, and the other is what I've already showed you about how the, the river patterns don't fit. Well, what would we expect this to look like if it was eroded by our rivers? And, uh, you know, we weren't there. We can just make wild guesses. But here's one attempt, one interpretation of what a river eroded staircase might look like on the right. So in this case, the rivers follow the pattern of the cliffs. They can show how you cut these canyons and how you would carve uh, these cliffs and leave it the way it is. But of course, <clears throat> that's not what it looks like. Um, the evidence doesn't fit the hypothesis of river erosion forming the staircase. It doesn't, uh, the rivers don't follow what you'd expect if they had cut the staircase. Uh, it, it looks different from that. And so I think my hypothesis still is the best one. <clears throat> Some kind of a massive continental scale erosion process that cut the landscape, cut the staircase, and then the rivers only f work out the final details. Now we can ask, um, where did the sediment go? All, I mean, there's, 
it's not just the staircase. If you, it goes way up here in Wyoming, Colorado, all of this. There was just an un, unimaginable amount of sediment that has been eroded out of there. Where did it go? Well, the, the river, the drainages all go this way, and there's evidence uh, down here that a lot of the sediment came down, down here in Southern California. There are, there are deposits here with, um, with transported micro, little, micro, little fossils, microbic fossils that came from Wyoming. Okay, so it came here, and then where did it go? Well, out in the ocean somewhere, um, a lot of it, some of it stopped here, but, but not by any means uh, the majority. Does, that, does the evidence seem to fit that? Here's a graph from a paper that analyzed the sediment in the ocean. <coughs> uh, going back 60 million years, that would be on the standard time scale, that's, that's the Cenozoic. Remember I said it's believed that all this huge erosion off the west was in the last five million years, okay? So here's the amount of sediment in the ocean. Here's this spike, five million years. I suggest that's, that's our sediment from Wyoming and Utah and Arizona uh, out here in the ocean. Okay, let's just come back a little bit here to, to uh, philosophy, to uh, worldviews and how we understand this. Uh, two different approaches, very different. Uh, is it reasonable to, to, to use this approach to do science? Um, well, I'm suggesting it is, but someone may say, well, is it safe to do this? Uh, they may be thinking of some work they saw done by a creationist um, that was shallow. And so it scares them off to, from using this approach. Well, is that uh, a reasonable reason to be scared off? Actually, if we look at it objectively, you find shallow work and careful quality work under, from both approaches. Ne neither approach has a, has a corner on shallow work or on careful work, quality work. You'll find both kinds of work, uh, and, and you know, we're all humans, and some are careful and some are not. And um, you find that in both groups. We can't, we can't deal with shallow work. We can't settle for that. We must, no matter what, how we start to think on this, we must do careful quality work. And <clears throat> if we do this carefully, in fact, um, just thinking of it philosophically, the more correct your worldview is, the more correct your understanding is of history, um, the better your hypotheses you should be able to derive from that, right? I mean, if you're way off, your thinking is going to be wrong. Uh, a more correct worldview applied consciously and deliberately leads to better hypotheses. And I predict that the more we do this kind of work, uh, the more we will see that this is true. Uh, I could give you many other examples of, of this that have already been done to show that this works. Now, we don't, we don't go out there and say, well, you know, the Bible tells me this, and therefore I have to explain the rocks this way. But... The Bible gives us clues, it gives us suggestions. It says, if you look here, you will find something interesting. It says, this is how long it's been. If you believe that, you'll, you'll have a better chance of finding the right explanation. And so then, if we're going to do science, we take those ideas and we go out and we think of, of actual testable hypotheses about the rocks. Uh, well, what, what if our hypothesis turns out to be wrong? Well, any, any scientist must face that possibility because just because we believe the Bible doesn't mean we're going to come up with the right hypotheses. We may have to go through several different ones before we find the right one that actually fits not only the Bible but the science. And so <clears throat> it takes persistence, it takes carefulness, um, but if we get our clues from here and then we use them to do science, there's no reason why we can't do very effective uh, science. So uh, consciously and deliberately apply our worldview. If we don't, we'll miss things. There are things we'll never see. And I could give examples of that. Um, and I think the staircase is one. This other paper I read, I mean, he didn't, he didn't try to test between a, a, um, a catastrophic model and, and a river carve process. He didn't. He wasn't thinking in those terms. 
He was thinking only in one world, one world view, one hypothesis. Well, it must have been done by processes that we can observe today. <clears throat> and I, I'll give you another reason for thinking that this works. <clears throat> we get a lot of criticism from other scientists. They say, well, you, you're going to be biased. You're going to be, you, uh, you know, that's going to bias you. You can't possibly come to the right conclusions. Well, is it possible somebody else might be biased? And I, I, I would suggest that we, those of us who think in these minority terms, have an advantage, a de distinct advantage with other scientists do not understand. Uh, I read a lot of um, the anti-creationist literature, books and articles, and it's obvious to me from all those things that I read that those people really don't have any idea how a, a, an educated creationist thinks, how an educated Bible believer thinks. They know their worldview. They know the way they, the explanations they give. They know how that works. They do not understand even that there's another possibility. They know only their worldview. For those of us who start uh, from the Bible, if we're going to do science, we can't escape learning all that what scientists have done, what, other, what the other point of view has done, what they know. We have to know everything they know, plus we're also thinking of another worldview. And some of us who, who do this kind of work, we're continually thinking, okay, of these two possibilities and what, where we can find ideas within them that we can test. How can we test between these two? Okay, that's where we get the advantage that the other scientists don't understand. Because we are, in fact, challenging both points of view and wanting to understand how they work and what gives us the best explanation. <clears throat> and we don't need to be afraid of that. Uh, we don't need to be afraid of data. Um, I have confidence that, that the Bible will give us correct direction. And even though it may take a lot of time to understand it and to apply it to the rocks, ultimately I'm not afraid that uh, our, our explanation will come up wrong. <clears throat> if we make mistakes along the way, fine. We're just like everybody else. But ultimately, uh, but I believe ultimately this is true. A more correct worldview applied consciously and deliberately will lead to better hypotheses. Um, if, we don't, if we don't do that, if we don't challenge ourselves to think in new ways uh, of what might be a more explanation, we're, we're in danger of being in this situation. If we don't apply our worldview in research, we could come to this situation. Well, I don't see any point in looking further. There isn't anything unexpected here. Okay, have they missed anything? <laughs> yes. And if we only look at the world from one point of view, we will miss an awful lot of things. And again, I could give you many specific examples of that. Um, if, if, if we're looking at this way, comparing uh, our biblical worldview with the other one and helping that using that comparison to force us to do careful work, um, we will see things that we would miss otherwise. <coughs> Come back to our hypotheses. Conventional geological hypotheses of rain and river erosion over millions of years. Is this adequate? And I would suggest the hypothesis that seems to best explain the erosion is a continental scale, apparently catastrophic water erosion event or series of events. So if I apply that, my conclusions are the Grand Staircase is really composed of much of Utah and northern Arizona, not just southern Utah and a little bit of Arizona. It's most of, of, the, of the Colorado Plateau in um, Utah and northern Arizona. Now, when I say much of Utah, that's, that's sexually um, eastern Utah. But it goes all the way from northern, down in northern Utah down into uh, central Arizona. This is all one landscape formation process. Number two. The erosion of the Grand Staircase was by a continental scale, apparently catastrophic water erosion event or series of events. Number three, at the end of or after the main erosion event, modern drainages developed and shaped only the final features of the landscape. <coughs> so in, in looking at a, this in a broader sense, a biblical worldview can function effectively for developing testable hypotheses for geologic events and process, processes. Are these hypotheses correct? You notice I didn't say I proved how the Grand Staircase formed. 
I, I developed a hypothesis with which I would not have seen if I had not deliberately taken a different point of view. My worldview predicts that, that, uh, that this, these hypotheses are at least going in the right direction. They are ultimately testable hypotheses. Uh, our critics will say, well, if you take a biblical point of view, you can't possibly do science. You can't come up with testable ideas. Well, no, that's false. We definitely can come up with testable hypotheses, geologically testable hypotheses, and then we can test them. Okay, so I have a hypothesis now. Am I going to do the work to, to, to test this? Well, I hope someone will take on this opportunity. I'm not at a stage in my career where I can launch into a test of this understanding of the grand staircase. Um, and it is, in fact, an opportunity. I hope someone will take on the opportunity and use this to guide research and to, in fact, test what is the, 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 the explanation for the grand staircase that will stand up to, to all the evidence. Okay, thank you. Where's the light switch? Okay. Paul has the answer for us. No. About another piece of the puzzle, maybe. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I have observed uh, both in the uh, Red Rock Canyon here in California and also in, uh, in an area just north of the, uh, I'm trying to think what the, it's a beautiful um, formation, it's in, I think it's in Arizona, but the, the entrance is through Utah and it's a, uh, the wave, mm. the wave, no. but it's not actually in the wave itself. It's in the area where the campground for launching into the wave is. Uh, there are, in both places, there's a stream, and there is a um, there is a uh, formation on either side of the stream, and I've drawn it, and this is a. Uh, uh, It's vertically exaggerated, or maybe I should say horizontally compressed. There's the river, or the stream, which is, of course, intermittent, and most of the time is actually dry. And it'll have its own little channel. And then these actually are, are sharper than this. They're, they're oftentimes just flat out cliff-like. Um, and, and, and they'll be on either side. And you'll see an area where there's a cliff and then there's an area where there's another cliff and what it looks like to me and unfortunately <clears throat> I haven't been in that area for long enough to be able to verify this but it looks like to me that there was at one time a fairly large uh, f flood if you like mm -hmm. that washed out these cliffs and then later on there was another flood that washed out these cliffs that wasn't quite as big and then you have the river itself. And if you were to take, excuse me, <coughs> I just ruined somebody's chalk here. Um, if you were to take, um, you know, this half of it, you have a staircase. Mm -hmm. And it's complete with layers in those, stair uh, those uh, cliffs. I have some photos of, uh, uh, at least the one in Utah, I may have some in the Red, Ro uh, Red Rock Canyon. But uh, it's really pretty striking to see that, and, and uh, I'm wondering if this may give us a clue. And it may even give us more of a clue, since if you have a large enough one of these things, 
um, uh, as opposed to the small river valleys that we're talking about, uh, you might have, after you removed some of this, you might have some doming effect uh, as the bottom rises up. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? Question. Well. Question. I got a question for you. I'm a trucker. I've been through all of this amazing what God has made. Yeah. You know, my, my real, real serious question has been, we, we know this earth is, as we know it, has been here for, you know, 6,000 years. All right. So where do they get these theories with all their education <laughs> of being millions of years old? Or is it true that before God created this, this some of this is here for million was here for millions of years? You know, well, and then he just kind of put it all together. I mean, I, I really have some serious, all these series of millions and millions of years that doesn't line up with the Bible at all. No, Explain okay. it. Well, you're asking a bigger question than we're going to answer today. Okay. Although, I, I can tell you, this, this was not here before the 6,000 years, and, and, you know, this is something that's happened since then. <clears throat> but let, let me come back to, to this issue here. Um, as far as the doming, <clears throat> except at the Grand Canyon, the evidence doesn't fit that there was doming here. Um, and, the, and, and if it would happen this way, where did this go? We don't have any evidence of, of this side of it. Um, and so, you know, it's a, if, if this was true, you still have to answer, why did this get eroded away and not this? And you'd be back to the same place where we are right now. And so I, I think that's not going to answer it. Um, the rivers are not going in a way that, that would work for this to work. They're, they're going this way across it. What I'm suggesting is we're talking a river hundreds of miles wide, which mm -hmm. is not a standard, yeah. uh, a standard theory. It's, it's basically a massive uh, flood mm -hmm. that would be comparable to, you know, uh, a significant portion of the size of the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but I but this this particular scenario I, I still think doesn't work because you got you don't have the two sides which you would have if it's even a huge river, um, unless the other side of the river is off in the ocean somewhere. But then it then we're back to the kind of massive water flow that I'm suggesting. So I guess we're we're ending up in the same place. Um, Eric, uh, yeah. We're, very good study, Leonard. I, uh, th this uh, you're getting into an area that uh, I think we have tremendous data that favors the biblical model compared to the Long Ages model. Uh, geomorphology uh, has not been studied by uh, creationists as it should have at all. And the, uh, of course, I think the, the greatest contrast, of course, is the, uh, the, the geomorphology, especially the Paleozoic, Mesozoic layers, compared to the present surface topography of the Earth. It's, it's, the contrast is just striking. Look how flat those great uh, canyon layers are compared to the canyon itself. But uh, I was very fascinated by the, uh, your your comment here that. Uh, uh, this paper that was just suggesting lateral scarp retreat. And this is one of the great geomorphological problems of the world, not just here, but it's over the world. Uh, how do you get cliffs to move laterally when gravity pulls vertically? Uh, this is not the way you expect your forces to pull, and as you well pointed out, uh, rivers dig down, uh, much more so than they dig laterally. You can talk about meanders and so on still, uh, <clears throat> and uh, figures that are of interest here. Uh, I uh, studied 12 different papers that deal with the average erosion rates of the continents of the world. Now, there are 
they're on my book, Origins. And uh, uh, these folks studied all these ri uh, rivers and uh, rates of erosion and so on, the amount of sediments going to the ocean. And the, the average turns out to be 61 millimeters per thousand years, which uh, we can translate to 60 meters per million years. And uh, if you have 60 meters per million years for erosion vertically, how does this paper propose to do one to nine kilometers horizontally with normal processes? A million years. He didn't, I mean, he didn't attempt to answer that question or even, or I even mean, recognize that question. His horizontal Erosion is a hundred times faster than current vertical erosion. Uh, quantitatively, that figure does just does not hold up. Uh, you're going to have to have a lot, a lot of water wash out all that sediment. I mean, rivers could move it here and there and uh, so on, but how are you going to wash out such a great area like the Grand Staircase if you don't have an awful lot of water? Yeah, that's right. He, he, and that paper didn't even acknowledge that that question exists. Um, uh, I, um, I might mention here, to encourage you maybe, we're preparing some of our graduate students to go into fields where we need more expertise. And one of my graduate students is, is working towards uh, becoming an expert in geomorphology. Now, I'm not a geomorphologist, so we found a, an Adventist geomorphologist with a PhD in geomorphology from New Zealand was actually directing his research. So uh, we look forward to him becoming knowledgeable in this area. <coughs> uh, another comment on this, as, as uh, Paul alluded to, there, there are a lot of places where you have this kind of a pattern around rivers. And one of the explanations is that, um, well, the, the river was up here at this level at one time. And it was meandering, as, as Earl alluded to, meandering back and forth. And it finally cut out this whole valley up here. Then it, it some, for some reason, started meandering less. And it cut down here, meandering just this far, and cut that level. And then it meandered less, and it cut down just this. Well, why would it do that? And what do we have any reason to think that that would happen? Probably not. A much more likely hypothesis is like you suggested, there was a, a massive uh, flood that carved out this valley, and then a smaller one that cut it down deeper, and a smaller one that cut it down deeper, and now all we've got is, uh, you know, a little erosion happening right in, in this area. Things have changed through time. It's interesting that both of those areas are places where flash floods happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. I don't think you have a lot of people arguing against the idea that both of those valleys were cut with flash floods, especially when... Humongous flash floods. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and now if we're talking about, you know, cliffs that, uh, that uh, let's say, you know, you go hundreds of miles in either direction, now we're talking about uh, flash floods of... of uh, um, Pardon the expression, biblical proportions. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was a flash flood, I guess you could say. Uh, could the could the staircase um, shape be explained by certain layers being harder than others, mm -hmm. cer certain ones being easier to row than others? Okay, that answers one question. Um, so you've got. Uh, let me just change this here. So we got a, one of these cliffs, and it's got different layers. Okay, why, does, why did it erode back to this point, and why is this the top? Okay, typically this upper layer will be a more resistant, that is we mean more resistant to erosion, a harder layer. And that, that, um, these erode faster, and pieces of this break off, and that's why the cliff is here instead of here. So it explains just that question. Why is the cliff here, the top of the cliff here, and not here? But it doesn't explain why it eroded back this far. Well, what I'm saying is the next layer down, if you could draw it. Down here? Yeah. 
So can you draw the layer going all the way yeah. to the left? Yeah. So, so it could be that if that if that layer that you just now drew, that top one, mm -hmm. there, if you could color it in, maybe. Yeah. This one. Uh huh. So if that was harder uh, than the ones directly above it, maybe, um, then maybe that could explain why things eroded on top of that mm -hmm. uh, before it eroded. Yeah. Well. This will explain why this cliff eroded here and not here, but I, I don't think that will work to explain the whole sequence. In other words, is there any reason to think that this, um, this layer is, is harder than the one that made this cliff? Well, not necessarily. I mean, one of these is the Cretaceous, and they're soft rocks, pretty much. There must be something a little harder here at the top. Um, but um, so if the very top layer was very hard, then then the whole thing should be just a enormous cliff. Is that right? Uh, well, it depends. It it it. This is too big an area, I think, to be explained that way. Uh, it, it's just going to depend more on how the water flowed and a lot of different things. Uh, could you put the 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 map back up? <clears throat> okay. Of the region. Uh, okay, I can do that. Need to uh, find it again. All right, let's see. So, um, go to uh, the next slide. Going to slide 34. 34, okay. Um, and then just go to the next slide, I think. So, I mean, I'm seeing two sides, not just one. Like, like say, for example, there's right there and right there that looks like two sides. You can imagine two sides here. Well. This way. Okay. So it looks like one side here, one side. I, I could imagine maybe this is eroded later. In fact, maybe there are some rivers here. So there could be a side here and a side here. Okay. Now, now this is extremely <coughs> wide. I have to show you a cross section to, to okay. answer that question. Uh, what you've got there is, um, well, we can do it here. See, this, this, is, this is a cliff facing south. This is a, a cliff facing the other way because what you've got is this This has been tilted up and this has been eroded off. So this may not even really be a cliff. It's, it's something different. It's not, it's not the other side of this. It's a different situation. So this is, this is roughly flat. I mean, you know, sort of flat. This is, this is the staircase here. So oh. this is, these red patterns here are only there because there had been uplifting and erosion, cutting cutting that sediment out of there. So, so this is pretty much flat all the way across here. Well, roughly. I mean, not exactly flat, okay. but it's. So, where where are the cliffs? Here, the cliffs are at the south e edge of, of each of these colored layers. Okay. Is it fair to call the 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 areas that, um, that kind of hogbacks? Well, I'm not sure what you're referring where to. Where the kind of the the oh the, the monoclines, the, yeah, and then and then cut down as a as yeah. a face. Right. So, so the massive flow of water would be like maybe along in this direction. Well, I'm not sure. I, I think one could study that. Could find uh, to examine which way it came. Did it come across this area? Did it come south? Uh, I'm not sure. <coughs> There, there, is, there is geologic evidence that if you have a lot of water flow coming across a region, it will begin to cut back, cut these cliffs, cut back. I mean, there's places where you can see this on a small scale happening. Uh, as the water level drops, it will, it will erode back. They're called headward erosion. And so there are s smaller examples you can mm -hmm. see today of how water flow across an area can, can make this series of cliffs. 
So that's implying that at at this level that the water's flowing southwest. Probably. Well, that's what I would think intuitively, but I, you know, I think one would need to do experiments to figure that. Out. Uh, do you know Art Chadwick's um, paleo currents? Uh, yeah. F at this level, what direction it's well, heading? I, I couldn't tell you um, where they'd be going here. I'd have to look that up. Okay, interesting. <clears throat> yeah, you've told us what it didn't happen. I guess what I'm asking is what's the mechanism that you're thinking? Mm -hmm. Because you've only got one side of the cliff. Everything is going down, 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 down. Yeah. So how did the water wash it out, or how was the water there, and where did it go? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay, let me mention one of these small-scale examples now. There was a, uh, I, I, I want to figure out where this is. There was an, a dam, I think in the northwest, that they decided to take out. Okay, so they began blasting this dam away in steps, and so a huge amount of water came out through this canyon out to the ocean. And it deposited a lot of sediment at the shore. And then as the water flowed across it this way, it carved cliffs going this way. I mean, they're you know, small cliffs. But a small example of this, uh, these cliffs. And so as the water f is flowing across, it will erode back these cliffs back. And, and so do you have any idea where the dam was, you know, how the water was there and then where it went? Well, I could just give you a, a suggestion. It was, the water was going this way, and it's eroding these canyons back and taking the sediment out. And so the reason you end up with cliffs instead of just a slope is because some of these layers are, are, are harder than others. And they will, they will last longer, and you end up with a series of cliffs instead of just a, a slope. Yeah. Um, is there any, anything in here that suggests the, the hardness of the, uh, of the sediment? And, and hence the ability to erode it in a short period of time? The hardness against the ability. Well, um, of course, for one thing, we don't know how long this would have been after the main part of the flood. If it was, We don't know if it was really cemented yet or not, firmly cemented. So that's an unknown. But also, when you have it like this, I mean, Niagara Falls, why does it... It's been eroding back for probably several thousand years. Why does it maintain a cliff? Because the layers down below are softer, and they will tend to erode away, and then chunks of this will break off. So uh, you know you, you erode it back, um, erode these softer layers, and so this part ends up sticking out. Well, it breaks off, finally. And so that's the basic process by which that kind of erosion happens. And so, uh, well, you know, that's, you'd expect that to happen if you have a lot of water flowing over the area. Uh, there were no glaciers here. That's one thing. No, not not here. So, and a glaciation would probably not do this. It, it operates different from that. Leonard, I guess uh, you ha you know these rivers that cut through these chains, like the Uinta, mm -hmm. the Green River cuts right through the Uinta Mountains. The Colorado River cuts right through the dome of the Grand Canyon, almost its highest part. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know of any experiment that suggests that uh, these could be due to uh, totally underwater? Currents localized mm -hmm. over these mounds. I, 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 it's so fascinating. We've got these in New Zealand. We've got them in Australia. Mm -hmm. The rivers, instead of going around the hills, they cut right through the middle of it. Uh, and uh, very intriguing thing. Uh, any intelligent river would go around, and they go right through the t the hill. So what he's talking about, you've got, a, you've got a mountain range here. 
and the river, instead of going around it, it cuts right through the middle. And this is a fairly common phenomenon. Um, well, one, one theory about that is <clears throat> the water was once over the top of this, and it, the, the river was coming through here, and as it began to cut down, it started eroding away the sediments around this mountain, and, or as the mountain came coming up, and the river just kept cutting where it was and cut down. Uh, you told us that years ago. I don't know if there's been any further good explanation since then. Superimposed drainage. We have it right nearby here, the Santa, Santa Ana River doesn't go around that range, it cuts right through it um, with all the traffic it goes through it. <laughs> now I can understand how the flood erodes its the stair steps. But each stair step has layers in it. Mm -hmm. How did the layers get there? Okay, now we're going back a step before. You've got to deposit the layers, and then you erode them into what we have now. And, and did so the flood do both of them? Probably. I mean, the erosion, I don't know if that was actually the end of the flood or something that happened a bit later. But anyway, the... The, uh, many of these layers, not all the layers would have been deposited during the flood, but, but uh, quite a few of them. And, and that's, I didn't even talk about that <laughs> step, but there, there are big puzzles there that are, that are easier for us to explain than, than other people. Because you have, um, well, the layer that, that holds up the top of, um, come on, <laughs> anyway, the, the chocolate cliff the lowest cliff there. That's the Shinarup conglomerate. Okay, it's formed of sand and little round pebbles like you'd find in a stream bed. Uh, it's, it's just amazingly uniform. It's 50 to 100 feet thick, over 150,000 square miles. Okay, it, it's the nature of the sand and the pebbles is what you would, might find in a braided stream. So that's the way they explain it. This was braided streams. Mm -hmm. Okay, where can you see a braided stream that is for quite uniformly covering 150,000 square miles? It's just a lot of things we see in the rocks just totally out of character for what happens today. Braided streams, even if it meanders and wanders back and forth, it's going to leave a very mixed, uh, complex deposit of uh, sand and, and gravel with mud mixed between areas of mud and then more gravel. And it just doesn't make a uniform deposit like that. And there are many of the layers of rock are like that. They look like a, like a process. They must have been formed by a process on a, you know, continental scale, a big scale. And we see nothing even beginning to approach that happening today. And so, um, you know, we can explain it, I think, a lot easier than anybody else can. But they, their, their world doesn't allow that kind of catastrophic action. Can't, you can't think in those terms and still be accepted as a scientist. Like the presentation, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think conclusion one and three are very tangible and no one can deny that. Um, the problem, and Ariel might be able to answer and you, both of you, is uh, the water flows in least resistant area. So if you have a dome there and massive amount of water going through, how did it cut through that? Why would it cut through the dome? To make the Grand Canyon? Right, anywhere, in That's Australia or New Zealand. Sure. You know, why would it? It would go around the dome uh, because it flows through least resistant site. Well, that's been argued among geologists for well, decades. <laughs> no, for us creationists, yeah. there should be an explanation. Well, the one that, that uh, Ariel mentioned, right, that I mentioned, uh, is a possibility that it, the river was flowing here, and the, the mountain began to come up, and the sediments were probably not fully cemented. So as it's coming up, the river just keeps cutting. Probably not, not a small river, but a, something, a big flow of water mm -hmm. keeps cutting and cuts on through it as it comes up. That's one possibility. 
That's antecedent. Uh, we, we talked about superposed. The other one that superposed, uh, the dome was there first, and the waters just happened to be channeling there, and they cut down through where there was a hill. Mm -hmm. They weren't worried about whether it was a hill or not. They were just going to go that direction. <laughs> Then question comes up, are there layers uh, on the dome itself? The Grand Canyon? Yeah. No, anywhere. Where, anywhere that's a river that's going through the dome. Right. Um, so there are, <coughs> like I think of one we saw in Wyoming, northern Wyoming. <coughs> it's very layered rock. It was, they were deposited horizontally as is usual. And then as, it, as the mountain came up, these layers now go like this, down the right. sides. Well. When the Lord created the world, perhaps there were no steep mountains. At least the Bible does not talk about that. So, and if these are layers that the river has cut through, um, we know that um, there was massive earthquakes going on mm -hmm. during that time. And the, I think the fountains of water from within the earth came up. So, who knows? I mean... <laughs> This is a, an interesting question to deal with, but because yeah. <laughs> again there are layers and the water and the river is cutting through that. Mm -hmm. So the the problem that everybody has is we were not there when it happened, right. and geologists can only geology can only explain ancient set of ancient features by comparison with what happens today, and nobody none of us have ever seen a global flood, so we don't know understand how it would happen, and so. There is that distinct disadvantage, uh, but by experiments, we can try to understand part of it. Well, the ones who deny the biblical uh, account, they were there. <laughs> uh, there is the advantage that if a river is flowing, or if water is flowing in a certain direction, it's going to find it easier to keep flowing in that direction than to go sideways. And if there happens to be a mountain in the way, who cares? As the waters recede, it's going to keep on going in that direction, which may explain these uh, rivers that go through all these hills all over the world. But it started simply as a major direction, one direction, and it just kept going that way instead of taking the longer way around. But when you don't have a hill in the way, that's the more logical way to go. That starts it, and once it starts there, it's still easier to go where you have a channel, so you can cut deeper and deeper and deeper. Just a suggestion. Mount uh, St. Helens had an interesting uh, mud dam that uh, trapped a whole lot of water, and then when it finally broke through, they uh, had a 30-foot uh, deep gorge that uh, showed multiple layers of uh, different mud flows that had occurred prior to while that ma mud dam was building up. And it, uh, in, just, in just, what was it, 24 hours, it uh, dug a 30-foot uh, gorge right through that uh, mud dam. And, and it's a question of why would it do that? <clears throat> this is an, an interesting point. Um, when most geologists, are, again, are, are looking at these questions of how this erosion happened, they're assuming that things were going on more or less steady back through time. Now, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's an illustration I've used um, right up here in Loma Linda. Uh, there's, a, there's a gorge cut down through a hillside. Uh, it's, it's pretty big, uh, 30 feet wide or so. You know, and so I, I measured it. Figured out how what was the volume of sediment in, that was taken out of this gorge, and um, and then I, I, you know, from watching this over the years, I've kind of estimated how much probably gets carried out each year. Probably a you know maybe a square meter at most, very most. And so I calculated how long would it take to cut this gorge. Thirty thousand years, twenty to thirty thousand years. One big problem with that calculation, and that, that's, that's the way geology will approach this question, how long did it take? One problem is I hike that route uh, several times a week, and seven years ago that gorge was not there at all. <laughs> it was just a smooth hillside. 
Okay, so what happened? Well, uh, one th two things happened. One, some developers cut a road along the side of that hill, and they didn't provide for proper drainage. Um, it was just a couple hundred meters of hills of road, but anyway, and then that was followed by a, a wet winter. This gorge was cut in one season, probably in a couple of weeks of actual storms. And then nothing much happens. That's the way it is. Um, if, you, if you disturb a situation significantly, like Mount St. Helens, then erosion happens very rapidly until it reaches a new equilibrium, and then not much happens. So we look at the Earth today and, well, things happen very slowly. That's because things are more or less in equilibrium. You look at the Middle East, they don't look like a very good equilibrium. But anyway, geology is, is close to being in equilibrium. Uh, and so nothing much happens until you disturb the situation, like during the global flood. And then all of a sudden, chaos ensues. <coughs> One other question. At the base of these uh, uh, cliffs, um, has anybody systematically measured how much talus slope you have and done any kind of calculations as to how often stuff falls off the cliff and how long it would take to build the talus slope that's there, assuming uh, standard uh, rates from today? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody has done that kind of work somewhere. I haven't seen a paper on that in regard to the Grand Staircase. The, and if you reason, look at these cliffs... The reason I ask is yeah. because supposedly in Monument Valley somebody did that and the uh, stuff that's at the base was about 4,000 years worth of pile there. And, you know, it kind of suggests that the last time something went and cleaned it out was 4,000 years, Recently. more or less. Yeah. Uh, if in general, these cliffs don't have a lot of serious talus at the, at the base, stuff that's collapsing. So you wonder why. It looks like they've been cleaned out wh whenever this happened. And I, I have a, you know, I, I think that really what happened is there was major erosion like at the end of the flood or sometime later that formed this basic landscape and then not much has happened since then. That's just an idea and I, I, think, I think that's the way it happened, but I couldn't demonstrate it. What I'm wondering is uh, would that be one way of, of uh, getting evidence one way or another for how long ago the last cleaning was? Perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, how how these areas got washed out. Uh, you talk about building up talus, and this whole Grand Terrace staircase should be full of talus. Mm -hmm. It's all cleaned out. Uh, we're talking about something different than what's going on right now. Well, I suppose if uh, nobody has any further questions for now, uh, uh, we want to thank you for uh, your presentation, and uh, uh, we we hope that your future re uh, research and those uh, of others who are working with you and following you will uh, um, make more clear some of these issues. Thank you.